My name is Zach Ochaga, and I'm the lead pastor of C6 Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I want to thank you for choosing to be a part of this service online today. I am confident, trust in God, that this would be a memorable time for you and a life-changing moment. If you are here today for the very first time, you've never been to our, to our in-person service, and you've never joined us online, please do us a favor and fill out a connection card, especially if you're in Sioux Falls, so that we know that you joined us online today. We'll be glad to hear from you, and I'll drop you a line or two in an email saying thank you. Before we continue with our teaching for today in the series, Tune Up Your Relationships, let's worship God in a song. One of the things that we do as followers of Christ is that we sing songs as an act of worship to God. So hopefully, you'd be able to join us. And if you're not comfortable doing that yet, that's okay. Just Stay tuned in and remain a part of this service. See you in a bit. You give life, you are love. Bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. Bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, since your breath in our lungs, so we pour
it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you Lord. it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs we pour out our praise to you only. Welcome back. Once more, thank you so much for choosing to be a part of this service today. We are in the third part of our series titled Tune Up Your Relationships. And one of the things that we've talked about in the previous two parts is how that in 2020, COVID and the lockdown revealed to us the things that are more important and the things that we thought were the most important, but showing us that they were not that important. We thought we could not survive without games. We thought we could not survive without special events. We thought we could not survive without going to work and being in an office, an office space all day. But COVID showed us that we could survive without any of those. Well, one thing that COVID showed us too on the lockdown is that one thing that we have played down, we have not given much attention to, which is our relationships. Those relationships are more important than anything else. Now, there are marriages that have failed and, 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 and broken, even with zero infidelity, simply because the people in the marriage, the couple did not give the marriage the time and attention it deserved. And they probably were an autopilot only to discover after a while by something that triggered the breakup that they could not live together anymore. We've lost a lot of ground and a lot of territory in our relationships, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your family, whether it's at work, and whether it's in church. My prayer, my desire is that through this series, God will help us reclaim what we've lost and help us be the people he wants us to be in our relationships. We've had marriages where there were cases of infidelity in those marriages, and yet those marriages did not break because the couple decided to be intentional about their marriage, making it the priority that it should be. And as a result, the weather the storm. My prayer for you is that the most important relationships in your life would not have to be destroyed, but that God would help you and God will help me make the relationships that he has blessed us with our priority. We live in a world that is sinful. We live in a world that is broken. We, we live in a world that is full of selfishness and, and self-centeredness. We see pride and arrogance and unhealthy self-esteem displayed and demonstrated almost every direction that we turn. We see that work even in our families. You know, sometimes I watch my kids fight with amusement. <laughs> you know, even in children, there is the sinful tendency and nature of selfishness. 
And we all have it to a certain degree. And this is the reason why <laughs> we need Jesus. We need salvation. We need saving. Now, before we go into the passage for today and see what God's word has to say about selfishness, pride, arrogance, self-centeredness, would you pray with me? Father, I ask, help our hearts be open to receive your, your word. Change us by what we hear today. Open our ears to hear you and make us the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So what, what, what does God's word have to say about how selfishness eats away at relationships, about how pride eats away at relationships? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 through 15. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So in verse 13 that we see, Paul tells the church in Galatia and us too that freedom is an opportunity. The first principle I want you to see here is that freedom is an opportunity. He says, you've been called to freedom. Anybody who has placed his faith or her faith in Jesus Christ and has become a follower of Jesus Christ, something has happened and it is freedom. Jesus has freed the person from the bondage of the law and of sin and of death, eternal death. There will be a final redemption from physical death as well. So you have freedom. Oh, freedom is something that is highly celebrated, greatly desired, and pursued by so many people. The United States of America as a nation is, is on the foundation of the principle of freedom. It's called the land of the brave and free. This is a land of the free because of the brave. Freedom is priceless. One thing that we see in the passage that we've read in verse 13 is that freedom is an opportunity. Freedom is, is, is an opportunity for sin. It's an opportunity to be worldly. It's an opportunity to be selfish. It's an opportunity to be self-centered. You can use freedom as an opportunity for evil and for the wrong. And this is why Paul, in writing to the church in Galatia, said, Do not use your freedom for an opportunity for evil. Rather, he called them to use freedom as an opportunity for good. When you are free, you have options. When you are free, you can decide what to do and what not to do. When you cannot decide what to do and what not to do, then it's no longer freedom. The call here is that the freedom should be used for good. So when you think about your relationships, when you think about the, the most important relationships in your life, when you think about your, your marriage, when you think about your relationship with your spouse, when you think about your family, and you think about your relationship with your kids or your relationship with your parents, when you think about your friendships, your relationship with your, with, with your friends, when you think about your colleagues and your relationship with your colleagues, when you think about church, 
and your relationship with people in church. Remember that you have freedom and it is an opportunity for you to either do good or do wrong or do bad. But the call from scripture is that our freedom should be used to do good. So the question here today is what will you do with your freedom? What will you do with your freedom? And Paul calls and tells us what we should do with our freedom. And if you're taking notes or whatever it is, you could just observe. He calls us to serve each other with love and humility. Serve each other with love and humility. So what we're supposed to do with the freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom that we have from God is to serve each other with humility. So rather than use our freedom as as an opportunity to satisfy our sinful nature, to do the things that do not please God in our body and through our body, God has called us, us to serve each other in love and humility or with love and humility. The marriages that will survive, the relationships that will survive, are relationships and, and, and marriages that the people involved serve each other. In, in, in serving each other, you must, you must think about the interests of the, of, of, of the other. You must put the interests of the other before you. Otherwise, you would not be able to serve. One of the challenges with serving each other is that we have the sinful tendency and nature of selfishness, of pride, of arrogance, of self-centeredness. And so it stands in our way of, of serving the other. If we're going to serve the other, then humility must come into play. Pride must be shown the way out. We must think about the things that would help that person and not what's in it for me. What do I stand to get from this? And there's so many subtle ways that even when we think that, oh, we are reasonable and, 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 and we are not uh, looking for our, our own interests, we're just looking for the interests of the other, many times we are motivated rather by what's in it for us rather than what's in it for the person. So what is, or how can you go about serving each other? Here's an important principle. Here's an important step of faith. Here's an important step of action to help you in serving the other with love and humility. And it is, it is this, grow, grow in loving others as much as yourself. Grow in loving others as much as yourself. We have an opportunity to grow. We have an opportunity to grow in loving others as much as ourselves. The tendency is to just be focused on ourselves and be absorbed with ourselves, but God calls us to grow in our ability to love others as much as ourselves. So what is the key to growing in loving others as much as ourselves? It is this, and it is so important. See yourself and others through the lens of the cross. See yourself and others through the lens of the cross. Now, when we talk about the lens of the cross, we're talking about what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus died on the cross to reconcile us with God. When you see yourself and you see others through the lens of the cross, a few things would become obvious. 
One is that you would learn that you and the other are loved by God. God loves you and God loves others. Now, sometimes we are blinded by the wrong that has been done to us. We are blinded by how we've been hurt by someone else. We're blinded by the evil that someone has done. And as a result of that, we think that we are way better than them. And they deserve the worst that they can get. But when you look at people through the lens of the cross you would see that you also deserve the wrath and anger of God as a result of your sinful nature. And that person and yourself, Jesus died for both of you. Jesus died for both of you because Jesus loves both of you. Now, when you see that, Humility begins to come into play because you no longer see yourself as better off. You no longer see yourself as superior to the other. You see yourselves, yourself and the other, as all recipients of the love and the grace of God. When you look at people through the lens of the cross, you see that you learn that yourself and those people are all victims of sin and of Satan. You're all victims of sin and of Satan. And this changes your attitude completely. It shifts your attitude regarding people because when you look at people through the lens of what they have done, then you tend to compare and contrast and say, well, I'm better off, I'm superior. But when you look at them rather than through the lens of what they've done, but through the lens of the cross, then you see, hey, we are all victims of sin. We're all victims of Satan. And as a result of that, we have received the grace of God. As a result of God's love, God's kindness, we've received the grace of God that we don't deserve. None of us deserve the grace of God. It's unmerited. It's the unmerited favor of God. It changes our attitude towards people. And now we can serve them with love and with humility. So I want you to think about who it is right now that ticks you off. Who is it right now that makes you angry or has made you angry? Or who is it right now? that has offended you or hurt you. Now, if you look at that person through the lens of what that person has done to you, you're not going to serve the person with love. You're not going to serve the person with humility. But when you look at it as, hey, you two are a victim of sin and Satan, and you have been saved by the grace of God. You did not deserve it. You did not earn it. It will change your attitude. When you see that God loves that person too as much as he loves you, it will change your attitude towards that person. A scripture that helps me with this, and I would love for us to memorize it this week. If you have not memorized this scripture before, memorize it this week. Matthew 7 and verse 12. Jesus said, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and prophets. Now, in those days, what most rabbis and uh, Greek scholars would teach, or the, the, the Greeks would teach, would be, uh, do not do to others what you do not want done to you. But Jesus flips that. And Jesus says, do to others what you want done to you. This means you need to be proactive. So, in your marriage, for example, you would not sit down and be waiting for your spouse to do what you want done to you. Rather, when you feel a need in your marriage, that something that you need that is missing, 
You want, you want to be treated in a certain way, and your spouse is not treating you that way. What Jesus says is for you to treat your spouse the way you want to be treated. When, when, when you, you want to be spoken to in a kind manner, when you want your spouse to spend time with you, and, and, and you're not getting that, what Jesus says to do, rather than scold your spouse or say, hey, what's going on? You're not doing what you need to do. Jesus says, do for your spouse what you want done to you. When you think about your kids and the things and ways that you want your kids to behave and, and to treat you, Jesus says, treat them that way. Boy, this is an area of growth for me. <laughs> in my family when you think about the people that you work with work with or you think about the people that you relate with in church jesus says rather than waiting for them to treat you the way you want to be treated jesus says treat them the way you want to be treated so if we are going to serve each other with love and humility, one thing that we must do is to look at people through the lens of the cross. And after we have looked at them through the lens of the cross, we must become proactive. We must become proactive by doing for them what we want done for ourselves. And this would help you, this would help me to grow in loving others as much as we love ourselves so when paul writing to the church in galatia in verse 13 saying hey freedom don't use your freedom for as an opportunity to do evil but rather serve one another with love and then he goes on to say, he, he, he goes on to say in the last part which is verse 15 of that passage he says watch out stop Fighting each other. Stop attacking each other. Lest you devour yourselves. So the, 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 the last thing that is so important to do if we are going to serve one another with love is that we need to stop attacking each other. The picture that Paul paints there is a picture of wild animals that prey on each other. And when you look at uh, some of the translations of this passage from, from, from the original languages, it, some of the words used are stop biting each other. Stop biting each other. Stop bickering at each other. What Paul is saying is, hey, stop hurting each other. Stop tearing each other apart. Stop being critical of each other. There are things that we must stop if we're going to serve each other with love. Does this mean that we, we shouldn't complain about bad behavior? Does this mean we shouldn't point out sin and we shouldn't point out bad behavior? No, that's not what it means. You can point out bad behavior without attacking an individual. You, you can point out bad behavior and point out sin without tearing someone down. Now that you have pointed out the bad behavior, you've pointed out the sin, the question is how can you serve that person with love to help that person in and through that situation? One of the things that we've become so good at, you know, in the body of Christ is to throw away the baby with the bath water. Now, what Jesus wants us to do is he wants us to learn how to take the baby out of the bath water, throw away the bath water, and then get clean water to rinse and clean up that baby. Separate the two. Understand the distinction. So when someone is in sin or someone has done wrong, 
Loving that person does not deny the wrong that has done and does not deny the sin that has been committed. Loving that person identifies the wrong that has taken place, identifies the sin that has been committed, but then finds ways to serve with love, to help that person either overcome or help that person be who God wants that person to be. And sometimes it also involves setting some boundaries. And boundaries is not just a word to say, hey, I don't want to ever have anything to do with you. No, that's not what it means. So friends, we've been called to serve each other with love. What would happen if in our marriages we stopped attacking each other, stopped biting at each other, we stopped being so critical of each other. We stopped tearing each other apart, but rather served each other. Rather thought about ways we wanted to be treated in the marriage and then treat the other that way. Rather, we, 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 we looked at the interests of that person we, looked up, uh, we look at the ways that person struggles and, and find ways to serve, to help that person be who God wants him or her to be. How about we, 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 we apply the same thing in our families and, and in our friendships and in, in, in church and in church? You know, Paul says, if we keep biting at each other and devouring each other, we'll no longer have each other because we'll have destroyed ourselves. We've seen many marriages, we've seen many families, and we've seen churches destroyed because the people involved preyed on each other and devoured each other. But the, the good news is if we would focus on Jesus Christ, Focus on what he has done on the cross for us, not just for you, but for others. And look at people through the lens of the cross and make up our minds to grow in loving others as much as we love ourselves and deciding to stop the things and the habits and behaviors that devour ourselves We'll, we will see a difference. We will take back grounds that the devil has taken away from us. We'll take back grounds that we've lost as a result of previous sinful behavior. Would you commit to serving your spouse and serving others in your life with love and humility? And I know God will bless you. God will help you. And you'll see a great change. For those of you who call C6 home, we know we pay our tithes, we give our offerings. And, and when we make these donations, you know, in church, we, it, we don't see just as a donation to the church. We see it as an act of worship. It is one of the ways that we worship God. We don't, we don't give simply because of what we, what's in it for us. We give because we worship God. And everybody worships something. Everybody worships something. And what you worship takes from you. It takes of your time. It takes of your resources. Some people worship sports. And, and the sports takes from them their time. It takes from them their resources. You know, we worship God. We worship God. So thank you so much for your generosity uh, towards C6 as an act of worship to God. And for those of you who are guests, please, you're not obligated to give. Just take this service and this teaching as our gift to you. If you're looking for ways to give, just look below the screen and you'll see uh, our website. You can go online and give, or you can simply text the word give to the number below 605-468-2626 and give. Thank you so much for being a part of this service. God bless you. Have a great week and see you next time.
And hey, if you are, I just want to remind you, if you are in Sioux Falls and you're, you've not yet registered for a growth group, please sign up for a growth group. A growth group is simply a group of people, 15 to 20 people who come together to learn the Bible and, 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 and build friendship with others. But primarily you're together to learn the Bible. Our spring growth groups will be starting the week of the 20th of February. And if you have not yet signed up for a growth group, please sign up. You can simply go, uh, go online to our website and register for a growth group.